Welcome to the very first episode of Life by the Numbers. I'm Shingai Samudzi, and the goal of this show is to explore the role of both data science and user experience design used together to address some of the major economic and social issues of our time. In today's episode, we catch up with Richmond Newman, a San Francisco-based architect who is working to make actual human experience, rather than NIMBY-driven politics, the central consideration for developers of large-scale building projects in America's third densest urban setting. So today I have with me Richmond Newman, who is an experienced architect here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're going to just talk a, a bit today about some of his experiences uh, in this space, in urban design space, within the San Francisco Bay Area. So Richmond, thanks for, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for reaching out and inviting me. So let's start with just a little bit about your background. Um, how did you get into <clears throat> both the, the urban design architecture space and um, can you walk us through your early formative years in terms of developing the philosophy that you have today? Sure, okay, yeah. That's, that question sounds like you want me to wind it all the way back to my education days. So I'll kind of start from the very beginning real briefly that I actually applied to college to be a piano performance major. And I've always been fascinated by the intersection of math and art. And I felt that uh, music kind of captures that. Uh, I always, you know, dance and drums and music and rhythm, uh, big deal. And then architecture kind of struck my eye as well as being a fusion of math plus art, but which happens to have a little bit more of a business side to it as well than performing arts. So kind of faced with that option, I have kind of architecture and said that even if people don't like the art I produce, at the end of the day, I fulfilled a pro forma, I've put a roof over somebody's head, there are objective reasons to feel good. Whereas with a performance, if it doesn't hit, you know, all the right notes in the uh, audience's heart, there's kind of no value left, right? So um, I felt like architecture is an objectively defensible industry. I jumped right in. I uh, went to Carnegie Mellon, and I uh, grad went from 2008 to 2013. So uh, here I'm, you know, kind of been practicing in the Bay Area for about six years. I got my license as an architect in 20, early 2016. And, and uh, I've worked for seven architecture firms, ranging in size from two people working with pencils to 360 people working with, uh, working on most of the high rises downtown in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Bay Bridge, the na neighborhood is called Rincon Hill and about uh, five of those eight towers were built by a firm called Solomon Corwell Benz. Uh, so I, I got a, a chance to see the whole spectrum of software usage and design philosophy from the slowest and smallest moving projects to the fastest and largest moving projects. Um, it's been pretty fascinating. So what are the primary differences that you see in terms of how uh, a smaller firm might approach a project versus a larger one? And also understanding that just due to scope, they're probably going to be working on different scale of projects. Yeah, the biggest difference has to do with the fragmentation of the design team. Um, that when a project is small, the list of, I think there's, there's kind of two exponential functions that take place. The client on large projects tends to be very, very smart and have a long list of demands because there are very few parcels in the world that allow for large projects. So you have to make best use of those parcels. Um, whereas there are tons of single family residential parcels or small commercial storefront, et cetera. So the, careful, the care taken by the client to introduce a precise program on large projects is of course very, um, is kind of part of the course. And so it's a little more wishy-washy and loose and designy on the small side and a little more procedural and, and derivative, not derivative, but um, metrics based uh, on the large end, I'd say. And then when it comes to, to design team sizes, architects working on single family homes, uh, they tend to have a small team of consultants, uh, but the check-ins are maybe two or three, four times per project. Uh, so, and, and the review will be a one or two day quick check-in by that structural engineer, civil engineer, MEP designer, whoever it is. On bigger projects, every single week you spend, you know, between four and eight hours across the whole team, probably more like 20 man hours, just making sure your team of, uh, on some of my towers, I had 41 consultant parties. I, I, was, I was an energy modeler on uh, SFO's Terminal 1. I haven't gotten to that part about my background, but my last two years have been a sustainability consultant. So uh, I worked on SFO's Terminal 1. We had 63 consultant parties and the, the man hours spent making sure all the information is flowing right is an exponential drag on the project. Mm -hmm. 
So in terms of the, in terms of the clients that have um, different demands based on the, either the zoning or the type of project, what are some of the considerations that an architect has to start making once you start the project? So, um, you know, you, you, you specifically brought up how, you know, the parcel itself, the size may be a limiting factor in what can be built. What are some of the other considerations that need to be made? Sure. Yeah, I find code and zoning and parcel and, and urban design pretty fascinating because so much of it wants to be made clear and so little of it is. Uh, essentially, when people are working on parcels in San Francisco or anywhere, I think we have one of the more stringent city code systems. So I'd say that kind of, I'll, I'll talk about our city as kind of a worst case scenario, but there are many smaller towns for which it's a little lucid in this. Um, architects interact with two codes above all, the building code and the planning code, right? And, and, and I bet, you know, since this, this blog adventure is kind of based on urban design, you're probably familiar with this, but I'll kind of, for just for any listeners, I'll try, try and be basic about this. Um, the building code governs what is safe to build, what can humans occupy safely, and what will fulfill the intended use of the inside program of the building. Program meaning like the arrangement of rooms and spaces. So when it comes to bars, building code uh, has standards in place for how densely occupied bars tend to be, and thus how many people you must plan for in the case of an emergency. Um, and in the case of a building used for multiple purposes, such as a garage with offices and residential, or larger projects tend to have mixed uses in them, uh, the separation between uses uh, and the separation between residences and a residential unit, um, anywhere that there's a division of ownership, really, uh, the building needs to be kind of treated like multiple separate buildings and fire and acoustic uh, barriers have to be uh, put into place. Each, each major structural system in the world has different um, natural fire resistance and earthquake resistance, et cetera. And so the building code tries to tie together all the, the physical properties of the world and say, regardless of how we want this city to work, what is, what's literally going to happen in the case of a fire, or earthquake, or a hurricane? Um, and in the case of normal human you know, passage, how many elevators and how wide of a stair do you need to get those people out? It's really about safety. And the second code, the planning code, is a more subjective code that, uh, that really is a chance for, uh, I guess, uh, design managers of a city to enact their will or th to represent the people's collective will and judge whether a project is the right fit for its neighborhood. That's the code which starts to transcend a single building and think at the scale of the urban design. So those two kind of work hand in hand for what, how things must work inside the parcel and then the planning code with things like zoning envelope of how, where can the building exist physically and what types of uses can go inside in conjunction to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, those two work hand in hand. So, so the planning code is, is a manifestation of the community's desire for what the community will look like. That's right, yeah. And so the planning code governs things like where can the single family residential be and how far down this street does the neighborhood commercial corridor go mm -hmm. um, and at which points in this, let's, let's call that same neighborhood six blocks long, where in it can the buildings be tall and where can they be short? Um, are there historic buildings that need to be respected in terms of sight lines? Is there a famous church at the end of that neighborhood that, you know, you're going to build up to the height of the church, but, but lower it down somewhere else where there's a view to the bay to preserve. Right. Um, it's kind of, there's, there's never been a more precise uh, process developed for creating planning codes than just a group of kind of people who've lived there a long time circling up and saying, how do, how do the residents of this neighborhood want this place to live? Like, mm -hmm. So who, who are the people that are actually behind the planning code that's developed? I mean, it's obviously at least, you know, living here in the Bay Area, not that long, maybe six years. I haven't seen any sort of open public process around, um, hey, let's design this. I've seen many public hearings in which people can protest, you know, based on points of the planning code. But in terms of the actual creation of the code, what is the process behind that? Yeah, so... So when cities are, in, are formed, uh, a, a general plan is produced and actually California as a state has templates for how general plans should exist. And then a specific plan is created for the city. And then a master plan is the physical overlayment of all those kind of abstract rules. And the master plan is the physical document for the, for the big map of the city. And then neighborhood plans um, are kind of a precise and idiosyncratically owned 
set of documents. I think that, uh, although I'm not 100% clear how the structure inside the city government works, uh, the planning commission uh, manages a process by which representatives For example, um, I, 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 when I, so when I, I mentioned that I've been a sustainability consultant for two years, but prior to that, I was working with a high-rise firm and we were evaluating the Divisadero corridor here in San Francisco for upzoning. And I think that they were trying to double the heights of the zoning envelopes along Divisadero Street to enable up to 12 and 14 story uh, residential and mixed use to be built. And that's, that's revisited, I think, on a five-year period just because it's such a uh, such a prolonged discussion that to kick it up every year would be um, would uh, would not allow the previous year's discussion to resolve, frankly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so in the context of San Francisco, which is where you've done a lot of the work, particularly in some of those larger projects, San Francisco is very famous for being very difficult with some of the planning codes, and um, not only that, but there's a, a, a political process among the citizens that's very resistant to certain types of developments happening in certain places. So can you speak more about, particularly for some of those large projects, what are some of the challenges that you ran into uh, just in that planning phase of actually figuring out what, what kind of design based on the client specifications is actually viable based on these sort of legal or political limitations that exist? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I, I guess in a very, very broad stroke uh, um, description, I, I see a, the, the limitations to construction speed coming from a few places. One is the state government itself. Uh, so at, at the state level, there are extra codes beyond pl building and planning here in the city, um, which must be abided by. And one is uh, the California Energy Code that requires it's, 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 uh, frequently called Title 24, but actually Title 24 is the name for all codes governing buildings. And Part 6 is the energy code. So Title 24 Part 6 has some pretty stringent um, requirements for each building type and building size. And it's being amended on, on a three-year cycle. So there's not, a, there's not a lot of time for the most recent iterations to percolate down to each city. San Francisco tends to be most in the loop, but outside these city limits, um, there's, there's uh, I think the California energy code is famously been a thorn in the side of developers who work in multiple states and then see this as a unique hurdle in California. Likewise, in the California Green Building Standards Code, also kind of nicknamed CalGreen, that's part 11 of Title 24, um, that code is, again, once again, statewide, and it plays in tandem with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, C-E-Q-A. And so review, review for the environmental impact of a project is done at the state level when projects are of a certain size. So a CEQA review results in an environmental impact report, an EIR, and that can either say that you will, um, your building will cause too much energy to be drawn for its design. It needs to be greener in terms of energy use or water use. Uh, it may impose too much traffic on the neighborhood around it, um, which is typically when there are large parcels, um, CEQA can be expedited by building entirely amid the rules of the planning code and it is caused to be lengthened when you try and make exceptions to the planning code and you say i want to build a building 40 you know 40 feet taller than you zone for and i want to include six stories of department store when you thought it was going to be a parking garage the impacts to the the, the, the city are studied both in the city government and also at by the state government. That's a, a unique issue in California that causes slowdowns in projects. Yeah. And what about at the local level? At the local level, California, you know, frankly, uh, I, I'm, vague, I'm roughly aware of exactly what's, uh, what's so unusual, but I do know that California has, I think, two, sorry, San Francisco has, I think, two more opportunities for neighborhood uh, uh, groups, you know, the kind of, they're class, we, we got classically called them the NIMBY groups, but um, na neighborhood groups to speak up and, and represent their neighborhood's interests. Uh, I think that in, where many cities have one and some cities have zero opportunities for those groups to speak up, um, in, there, are, there are in fact three places where those types of, pro uh, of uh, organizations can pause uh, d 
design and approval for between four and eight months a piece. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could give a more specific an answer or an anecdote about specifically who might have slowed down whom, uh, but I, I'm kind of drawing a blank on those examples right now. Yeah, no, no worries. So, so going back to some of the projects that you've worked on in, in uh, San Francisco, so you mentioned that um, you were one of the consulting groups for um, the SFO Terminal 1, which I think that just, is that still underway or has that gotten completed? I know there's still some construction still going on. They're building it in three phases and it will be done uh, in 2022. Okay, so we still have a, we still have a ways off. Good design began in 2014. And the RFI, sorry, the RFP was put out in 2009 and the budget was written in 2009 and then uh, it was awarded and commenced in 2014. Eight years later, it'll finally be done. Okay, so that's actually, is that, is that given the size of that? Because I mean, Terminal 1 is, is a pretty large terminal at an international airport. Um, so I can, I can understand the length of time, but how does that stack up to other projects of similar size in terms of that length? <clears throat> well, so let me just, I'll start by describing some of the particular constraints. I call it about 30% slower than other large projects and 200% slower than medium sized projects, 500% slower than small projects, right? But yeah. the SFO terminal one has a couple of constra constraints around it. The first is that SFO, it's our SF International Airport being an extension of the city government. It's a public entity, which means that um, there are, the review process for all bid awards is much more lengthy and you have to consider more parties. You cannot kind of buddy up with contractors you always work with the way that some private parties do when they're building tall towers or homes. Um, so, so the, you know, you must engage three parties with every bid, whether they're for design services, construction services, materials, labor, um, anything. And secondly, the I think everybody's aware of the, the hiccup in time from 2008 through 2012, 2011, where a budget written in 2009, even, uh, even accounting for the irregularity of the economy at that time, did not anticipate how quickly and how, how heavily the market would pick back up in 2012. Mm -hmm. So upon design, upon the commencement of design, we found that the budget for the project was, um, I think, only 60% of what it should have been. Mm -hmm. So almost, it almost needed to be doubled. And uh, that, of course, is heartburn for everybody and it's, and it's taxpayer money. So uh, the way that they resolved that took probably an extra 18 months into the schedule. Yeah. Construction-wise, that's, that's, that's on the design side and the budgeting side. It's all very slow to come about because of public process and the financial crisis. But on the construction side, the building must remain operational. That entire, I like to talk about the neighborhood, which they're calling the hub uh, at Van Ness and Market. It's a, one of the major muni stops downtown, and it's uh, it has the transportation potential to really support very tall parcels. Um, and so the four parcels on the corners of Van Ness and Market, each is zoned for 400 feet. One of them is zoned for 600 feet. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, actually, they're all zoned for 400 feet. And an interesting thing about this is that uh, at 30 Van Ness, uh, the developer of that parcel uh, has uh, basically put forth a proposal to, instead of putting, uh, putting two 400 foot towers on the site, put one 600 foot tower on the site. And in terms of capacity and environmental impact, uh, they're quite similar. Uh, it, because the, you know, kind of a, the 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 total number of units would be the same, even though the height is only fifty percent greater because the building's a little larger. So, by most you know metrics, uh, the impact on the neighborhood is quite similar. The impact on the skyline is substantially different, and so they think that for the same number of units, the uh, value per unit will go up because of the increased status of the part of the building. So, uh, it's it's an example of a. Not quite sure is this a justifiable difference from the planning code or is this, um, is there a particular reason why 400 must be the hard and fast rule across all buildings? I actually think that 400 is gonna make for a weird carrot top type look to that neighborhood. Um, just very, carrot top's probably a wrong reference, but very flat kind of haircut on the neighborhood uh, when you view it from places like Twin Peaks. So I'm in support of the 600 foot zoning change, but the different, the problem here is, um, the, 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 the San Francisco Planning Department has designated that parcel, 30, 30 Van Ness, 30 South Van Ness, the southmost corner, as the um, flagship of the four corners. And whatever they decide about that one will have trickle down ramifications on the other three corners. So it has thrown actually something like a five year delay into the development of the other three corners. Um, I worked on a design proposal for One Oak Street, which uh, was kind of 
let go of when they realized that uh, they were at the mercy of the approval process of a different parcel that was that just completely invalidated their their uh, ability to buy and in a timely manner sell and develop uh, the property. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of just kind of last thoughts that you have around, um, you know, what are things to watch out for from for the city of San Francisco and for the Bay Area in terms of challenges uh, around managing the the building and the planning process? Kind of what do you see? sort of in the future as, you know, questions like affordable housing start to get answered and people start to try to develop and create developments to address some of those issues. Yeah, actually, this is a, because it's one, one of the theses of your blog is uh, data analytics. And I, I've recently actually this year stepped into a software entrepreneurship role of uh, founding a, a technology company for designing buildings. I feel like it's a perfect time to kind of plug, plug the idea a little bit and also address your question. Um, I think that the difference between the building code and the planning code is, is important to acknowledge that one is pretty objective and by scoping down in size to what's inside the building, it's able to be written in a very numbers based, easy to prove way. So a trip to the building department to get a building code inspection is pretty straightforward. But a trip to the planning department because its ambitions are larger, they're harder to simulate and they're harder to quantify into numbers. So uh, it's, it's simulating the impact of a building on a neighborhood is much harder than simulating the, uh, the impact of a building on itself, structurally speaking. And so what I think is that uh, we are currently underserved for good tools to simulate uh, neighborhood and urban scale uh, effects and impacts. Uh, there are some kind of abstract tools that let you do that. And a very few cities, San Francisco is among them, but very few cities actually employ, you know, agent-based simulation for traffic patterns and uh, weather modeling at a city scale. We have the the data and we have at a cloud, at a, at a level of scale, we have the compute, but we don't have the organization inside a city government to leverage the two. So um, I think that uh, one of the things that my, my software Modumate is trying to tackle is reintroducing the idea of modeling the humans into building design because I didn't really talk about how software works today. It's almost entirely about sculpting the parts of the building and not representing any people or, or climate. And functionally, you know, culture is about the people. It's about how they behave in, a, in the context of a building. So I think that uh, a tool set which needs to emerge and I expect will emerge, whether it's through us or otherwise, is the modeling of people and how they behave, how they, what they want to do, the, their sequence of activities through a day, how they flow in traffic uh, at scale. Those simulations, I think, will trend the planning code towards a more numbers-based, uh, objective, and easier to approve process, instead of shying away from applying any numbers to a planning uh, philosophy. Wow, what a stimulating note to end on, I think. That's yeah. Maybe we can have a follow-up conversation uh, and I can check in with you in a few months about kind of well, as we develop the software because we are quite a young pre-product company. Um, I'll check in with you and let you know kind of how we've uh, been receiving this, how this idea has been received by architects because I'm sure that I'll be able to bear more news and thoughts by then. Yeah, I would love to and really appreciate Richmond that you came on and shared some of your experiences as an architect and urban designer. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Take care. Cheers. Bye.